Hey guys, it's LJEST2004 here, and today we're going to take a look at the full video of Jaden Manson's Guide to Houseplants from 1902. Here's the front, spine, no profile picture, and the back. Here's the tape, and let's see the full video. Tell me what you do in your leisure time. Nothing. That's why it's called leisure time. Do a lot of fishing. Easy. Let's go. Play and go. Welcome. I'm sorry, I, I stepped up too quickly there. The psychiatrists tell me that men... Oh, good start. Keep it going. Get it right with a gardening Australian magazine. Here's a plant that's found in most of Australia. No, sorry. You all know where this is. It's the botanical garden. It's the <laughs> Get it right. That's marvellous. That's why it's so healthy. But it's also... <laughs> well, roses are very forgiving plants. Sorry. All right, nobody's perfect. Well, <laughs> all right, nobody's perfect. But get this month's gardening Australia magazine, and you're on the way. On sale now at news agents and major supermarkets. Oh, why not subscribe? Ring our toll-free number. It's double o eight eight double o nine double three, and you can have it home delivered. Call now. Double o eight eight double o nine double three. Hello, I'm Jane Edmondson and welcome to Gardening Australia's video on houseplants. Houseplants have been used for years to bring cheer indoors into a home and more recently into an office. And I really like them because they are so bright and colourful when they're in flower. And it's not only the flowers that are so beautiful, it's the foliage. Interesting shapes and textures and sizes. They're wonderful things and I'm sure you'll find this video very helpful and informative. often ask questions about house plants and in this video you will find the answer to most of those questions. The beauty of it is, is that you'll be able to replay it time and time again and you'll always find something new and different to appreciate. I'm going to show you how to select house plants and how to choose the appropriate containers. We're looking at repotting and also propagation and what about pests and diseases? They're always a common ailment. I'm going to show you how to use plants appropriately in different places around your house. And we're looking at really interesting and unusual house plants as well as the beautiful ones. And where does it all start? Most probably in your local nursery. When you walk into a nursery that sells house plants, it can be quite a confusing experience. It's that massive colour that you're looking at and it really hits you in the eye. It's quite riotous. This beautiful anthurium or the flamingo flower with its tangerine orange flowers. And then the brilliant mass of New Guinea impatience. Fantastic to see. Even the foliage plants of a rubber plant like the spicus burgundy gives you a great lot of colour. And then the primula sinensis with softer colours. 
It's a primula that flowers on and on over spring. And how cute is that miniature impatience? Tiny little flowers with equally tiny leaves. That would certainly suit a windowsill. And this collection of miniature African violets would certainly suit a sideboard or a dresser. If you're wanting something to grow slightly larger, why not an Igini impatience? Great colours, they're a short term indoor plant. You can keep them indoors in a light, airy position. And have a look at the colours of the gerberas. They're great on their tall stems. They're pink and red and yellow and white. Great range of colour. And how's this for something different? It's the flamingo flower. Great tangerine red. You even get a variegated one that is really unusual. That is quite hardy indoors as long as it gets light and plenty of warmth. Hanging baskets are terrific if you've got the height. It's easy to bang your head on them if you haven't. This one's a Columbia, a magnificent specimen that needs to be kept moist, but not wet, in a light position, and it gives you those fantastic tangerine flowers. The nodding violet is a good one. It's an excellent one for hanging baskets. It has these mauve blue flowers, long stems, and they flower for a very long time over spring and again in autumn. And once they've finished flowering, Prune it back to make it compact and give the feed because then they'll flower again. And what about summer love? These beautiful red tassels that really are very effective in a basket. They suit a balcony or a patio also. You can grow them inside as long as it gets plenty of bright light. And keep them pruned regularly and take off any spent flowers because then you'll get even more flowers. And that's only a small selection of the flowering plants. When you're choosing a flowering plant, you might like it fully out in flower, but you might check to see if it hasn't got some buds so that you can get a succession of flowers. Remember, all flowering plants need good light or else they just won't flower. But for plants that really need filtered light only, you might like to choose a foliage plant, something like the piggyback plant. It's lovely and green, and it's got a cousin which has got speckly variegated yellow leaves. They're rather attractive. You've got the peperomias, which are very hardy, as long as they're kept moist, and they've got these sort of indentations on the leaves. For people who haven't got much time to look after their indoor plants, what about a ribbon plant or the chlorophyton? They are so tough and hardy, you really can't go wrong with them. I like the silver or the aluminium coloured leaves of these pileas. It's a beautiful little plant, quite good for a terrarium also. And then what about the selaginella moss? That's a flat ground covering plant that really looks good because of its gold colour. When you're selecting a house plant, don't just pick up the first one that you see. Have a good close look and see if you can't find the most healthy one. A flower that is damaged, put that one back. Go for one that's not damaged. The leaves should be green and spotless, no brown marks on them, no insect damage, and if they are a little yellow, that tells you that the plant may need some feed, so put it back. Go for one that's got green leaves. Generally speaking, a well-grown house plant will have enough food in there to last six months. And of course, the labels are very important because they not only tell you what the plant looks like, but on the back you'll find solid instructions to tell you how to grow the plant, where to put it, how much water and when to fertilise it. And if you have any doubt, just ask the friendly sales staff at your nursery. For plants with delicate leaves, like the African violet, it's probably best to buy them wrapped up in a sleeve like that. And that's good because it gives them added protection when you take them home. And of course, when you've bought your house plant, don't leave it sitting in the car, especially on a hot sunny day. Take them straight home, or else the sun can really get at them and frizzle the leaves. One criteria that you might have when you're selecting house plants is how much money you want to spend. Well, this is a very fine example of a Ficus benjamina exotica. It's about four or five years old and it stands very tall. This is the same plant, another Ficus benjamina, but obviously a younger version, only two years old. And in monetary values, it's probably worth about five times less. Of course, it will grow quickly and catch up to that if you allow it to. So it really depends on what you want to spend. Either way, there's one to suit your budget and your requirements. There are loads of different ways that you can dress up your house plants to suit perhaps 
the decor of your house. This is the way that you normally buy a house plant in a black plastic pot. It's perfectly simple and you can leave it like that if you want. But if you want to use the decorative pots, they come in all shapes and sizes and colours. There's a style to suit any position in your house. On a window ledge, for instance, a window box is a great idea. If you've got room for a hanging basket, make sure they've got a saucer underneath them so the water doesn't dribble down onto the carpet. The traditional way of displaying pot plants is in a pot. You can get them in large or small sizes. And then for a table decoration, have a look out for the Mexican bowls. They're rather attractive. Containers are made of all sorts of materials and terracotta is a very popular one for a rustic look inside. They're made of clay and being porous, the moisture does seep out, so you need to put a saucer underneath them. They're very unlikely to fall over because they're heavy and they really do give a good feel to the type of plants that you're going to use inside. Then there's the terracotta lookalikes, and they're often made of recycled plastic, which is good. And many of them look terrific, they do the job of plastic very well, because the plastic ones are lightweight, you can move them around easily, they're easy to clean, and also, not being as porous as terracotta, they don't dry out as much. And that brings us to these self-regulating pots. Your pot plant sits inside here in some soil and you water it through the gap there and it fills up the reservoir down here so you can actually see how much water the plant is using. By capillary reaction, the water is seeped up into the soil so if you're going on holidays for a few weeks it's a great idea. Now what I like to do is every month or so take the pot outside and if you see any salt build up at the top of the soil make sure that you completely leach that through by a good drenching of water and that's very important. There you can see the reservoir of water this is a more traditional style where it's hidden. And finally, there are the containers that are purely decorative. These have no drainage holes. So what you do is you slot the plant in its original container into that. And when it comes time to water, you take it out and put it in the kitchen sink. There are plenty available. There's beautiful ceramic ones. There's ones that are moss covered. There's hanging basket ones. Some made of wicker. There's brass types as well. And the one I really like is this made of tea tree brush. Now having selected your containers, you may find that you need to repot your indoor plants at certain times of the year. Don't just go out into the garden, dig up some garden soil and expect it to grow a happy plant. It can't be done. You've really got to look out at your nursery for some good potting mix. And this one here contains elements of sand and peat moss and milled bark. And that gives good characteristics of water holding ability as well as letting the water drain through. So you don't end up with a gluggy mixture in which your plants are growing. You can get various potting mixes. They're clearly labelled for specific purposes and conditions that you may choose. As with the potting mixes, there's a whole array of fertilisers that are commercially available. And don't forget, your indoor plants are living things, so you do need to feed them. There's a whole range going from the liquid-based seaweed ones through to the chemical ones that are soluble, you mix them with water, and then the slow-release fertilisers specific for indoor plants. Having fed your plants, you'll now have to water them. You can choose something like this, a watering can like that, with a very fine rose so it gives a gentle trickle to the plants. That's brass, of course, so it makes this one expensive. You may just choose a simple plastic one with a long nozzle so that you get in under the leaves, under the foliage, and that gives it good water. You can also choose an atomising spray so that you can mist the leaves quite regularly. Some people might like to buy a moisture meter to tell them how wet or how dry the soil is. I prefer to use my fingers. Secateurs are important to trim off any dead leaves or dead flowers. You don't have to have heavy ones, the smaller ones are just as good. And of course, what about a plant stand? If you display your plants on them, they'll really look terrific. House plants depend on you for their very success and survival. You can't expect them to grow with no food and no water. When you get them home from the nursery, there's up to 12 months of food in the soil, and then you should start looking for telltale signs that the plants need to be repotted, and this is one. Is a typical sign of a top heavy plant in a tiny little pot. It needs to be repotted. This poor old piggyback plant keeps wilting and there's a mass of roots in there that tells me that it's pot bound. It needs to be repotted. And here's evidence of this. Look at that. The roots coming out, the drainage holes. That plant should be repotted right now.
Use a good quality potting mix, not soil from the garden, and a little bit in the bottom, and then take the plant out of its pot by tapping it gently on the side of a bench. Ooh, look at those masses of roots. Tickle them out. You might even have to give it a bit of a root prune, and that is by breaking the roots off like that, you'll find that that will do the plant some good because then it will fit into the next size pot. You can even get the kitchen fork and scrape down like so just to get rid of some of the old soil and then those roots will take off into the new soil. Put it into the pot, make it about one size up the pot, don't go any bigger because about 2.5 centimetres bigger is fine. Put some soil around the edge like that and press it in and that will do just terrific. That will grow very well and the best time to do that is in spring. You must give it a water as soon as you've repotted it. Lift up the leaves and just water around. Water it gently but thoroughly so that the roots do settle into the pot nicely. And that will grow as good as anything. Now, how do you tell when your plant does need watering? The finger test is the way. Rub your finger about a couple of centimetres under the top of the soil and look at the difference. The dry one is the one that needs watering. And if you do have problems with watering, why not dunk the whole plant into a bucket or into the sink, watch the bubbles come up, and as soon as the bubbles finish, it tells you the plant is saturated. Right, that'll be fine down there for a while. Now it's feeding time at the zoo, because plants, like people, must be fed. And you can usually tell that a plant needs some more tucker when its lower leaves start to go yellow around the edges. It's crying out for some more nitrogen. Now there's plenty of fertilisers available. This is a slow release fertiliser. You only need a teaspoon and put them around the plant like that. Don't go overboard, don't use too much, and that'll last for up to three to four months. There are also liquid-based fertilisers. This is a seaweed one. You put a capful into a watering can and for flowering house plants, every two weeks, that'll give them a lot of nourishment. When you're looking at your house plants, just check that the leaves are not getting clogged up with dust because that can affect their breathing mechanism. Dip a wet rag into some milk or even some olive oil and put your hand underneath it so you don't crack the leaf. Just rub it over like that, right from to the end. You can use a proprietary brand and they'll do the trick and just have a look at that dirt. To increase the humidity around the plant, just a little mist spray regularly doesn't hurt. Now, that should do that one, but have a look at this ugly old beast. He's really outgrown his pot. It's a climbing philodendron, which are lovely plants, but really, this one needs a bit of attention. If you're about to repot it, you should repot it with a longer stake, because that then will help it grow and train up that stake. But for a temporary measure, I think I'll just take a grasp of it like that and wrap it round and use some twist tie just to stake it up so it looks a little bit neater. Now, if you ever see any dead branches or stems, don't be afraid to cut them off. It can only improve the appearance of that plant. Talking of making plants look a bit more attractive, if you ever see flowers that are withering or dying, always cut them off. It's called deadheading. That's really quite a good idea. It's a funny word though, isn't it? With a cyclamen like this one, there's the spent flower, take the stem and press it firmly into the corn and twist it around like that so that it comes out neatly and it doesn't damage the corn. It's quite a good idea to do that. And if you've got any leaves that are broken, always take them off because broken leaves and stem flowers can cause disease to spread throughout the plant, something like botrytis or grey mould disease. And use your secateurs or even nip the plants back with your fingernails. It makes them compact and much neater. So if you ever see a gardener talking to the plants, they do respond to tender loving care. It's lovely to have a cherished plant to bloom and flower around your house. They certainly give you pleasure. But when they start to look a little bit sick and miserable, it's like a member of the family. You really feel sorry for them. Generally speaking, it's cultural conditions. Either too much water or not enough of it. Maybe too much sun, maybe too dark, maybe not enough humidity around the leaves. There's generally some reason why they start to look sick. And very often it's pests and diseases. Now this one is a prayer plant. And if I look closely under the leaves, you can actually see mealybug. And mealybug is not a very nice insect. It's a bit like cotton wool balls in the leaf axils. It is easy to get rid of. 
let's get a cotton wool bud and dab it on with some methylated spirits and just touch that onto the mealy bug and you'll find that the bug just disappears and dies. And it's as easy as that on your palm trees as well. Tips of young plants or juicy leaves like this one are often devoured by aphids and they're horrible little creatures because they do suck the sap out of juicy things like this and they breed like rabbits. To get rid of them, you can squash them in your fingers if you can do that or maybe spray them with a pyrethrum based spray. Here's a problem that's a little bit more difficult to see. You can tell though when I compare two African violets. That one is pretty uniform in shape in the centre of those leaves, but this one has got definite signs of crinkly leaves distorted around the edges and a little bit of yellow marking in the centre, which shows that it's got spider mite. It happens in particular when you get dry conditions, so keep the humidity up around your plants and prick off any leaves and discard them. Another little sucker is the scale, and that's this brown and black thing that sucks all the sap from the leaf, like a little pimple, and underneath is the insect. To get rid of it, you need to spray or wipe with white oil. If you have a plant like this with holes chomped in the edges of the leaves, have a close look under the leaves. It might have been a caterpillar that causes that sort of damage, or on the other hand, it might have been a very hungry rabbit. Often the most gruesome damage is the simplest to cure. This one is just a sure sign of overwatering. Brown edges around the leaves and little brown spots in the middle. It makes a big difference if you feel around the roots to see if they're overwatered. And if you find that they are, it's obviously root rot. What I would do is snip some of these really damaged leaves off, take it outside and put it in a protected position and let it dry out. It'll come with no problem at all. Now this one is a scissors or the kangaroo vine, a lovely climbing thing, but it's got a fungus here that's causing grey powder over the leaves. It's not a fatal disease, but what I would do with this uh, downy mildew is simply cut it off and take the plant outside for a bit of a holiday outside, once again in a protected position, and it'll come good. A common problem is root rot, especially in cacti. If you overwater them, they tend to just completely rot off at the base. You may as well throw that one away. But to stop the problem, just cut back completely on the watering in winter and only frugally water in summer. On the surface, this is a perfectly healthy maidenhair fern, but there are telltale signs of salt buildup around the drainage holes, and that's caused by over fertilising. The remedy is to take the plant outside and give it a good drench with water to wash the salts completely through, otherwise, the plant's health will really start to suffer. One of the common problems that people have when they bring their plants inside over winter is the air humidity. It's too dry, especially when you have central heating or gas heating. It really dries out the atmosphere, and so you get brown leaves like that, makes the plants unsightly. With that fern, I would chop that back, take it outside, and it will regenerate quite nicely. Now, what you really should do, and make sure you do it with all of your house plants, is to spray them regularly on the leaves with a mist spray, and that'll keep the humidity up around about them. So when you water your house plants, just check for any attention they may need, and make sure that nothing is nibbling them. One of the greatest pleasures of gardening is taking cuttings or propagation. It's made very simple if you use house plants. Some people like to grow seeds, but if I give you the example of begonias, that's more expensive than gold. So what's easiest to do is to take a cutting, a fresh one from a plant, and perhaps put it into a glass of water on the windowsill. Now, here's an ivy that's got roots on it. It's been sitting there for about six weeks. And this one is a piggyback plant. If you put that leaf into a glass of water, it will strike roots in about four weeks. The trap comes when you have to move it from water into potting mix. So the answer is to put it into propagating mix immediately. This is a commercially available one, and this is vermiculite that you can also buy. It's very light and fluffy, and it helps the roots grow very quickly. My answer, though, is to use some propagating sand, coarse river sand, 
that helps for drainage, it lets the roots go through those coarse particles very well, and there's the peat moss that helps retain moisture around the roots. Use three parts of river sand and one part of peat moss, and this is like mixing up a sponge cake. Mix it up so that all of that peat moss goes through the coarse river sand, and then I'm going to put it into a pot like this one and pack it in very firmly and moisten it down. Right, that's fine for the cutting to go in now. You take a cutting early in the morning, in the early part of the day before it dries out, and about 10 centimetres long. And where you cut is quite important. It's under where the leaves are joined onto the stem. That's the node area. So just a few millimetres under there, snip that off with clean secateurs, and then take the leaves off up the stem because that stem is just going to be put into the propagating mix and those leaves will just rot anyway. What you should do is leave about four or five leaves at the top and that's enough. If you've got flower buds or flowers, you must take them off because they're taking the energy away from the roots growing down at the other end. Four or five leaves at the top and perhaps cut one in half if they look a bit too big and that will be a very good little cutting. Put it into your propagating mix using an old biro as a dibbing stick or a chopstick and press it in hard so there's no air gaps left around where the roots will form. Now, to encourage it to grow, use a plastic bag as a mini hothouse over the top or an upturned soft drink bottle just like so. And that will really help the roots to grow quite quickly. Check it every now and again to make sure the cutting's not drying out. The next cutting will go about a finger's width away and I will put about 10 cuttings in there. You can tell when they've struck your roots because they come out the drainage holes at the bottom. So that's a typical tip cutting. You can grow plenty of house plants just like that and it's very easy to do, but I want to show you something that's really exciting. This will really mind boggle you because it's actually using a plant like an African violet and you take the leaf of a simple African violet like so and that one leaf is going to grow roots down here and turn into a totally new plant. Quite fascinating. This one, how you do it, put the leaf stalk or the petiole in at an angle like that, press it in and you end up with something like this. There's the old leaf and a whole lot of little new leaves that have grown from it at the base. And that's a whole new plant. I want to show you something equally as exciting. This is the piggyback plant. That's the old leaf with the little new piggyback sitting on its top. And if you turn it over, you can see very prominent veins. Well, if you use a sharp knife just to nick those prominent veins all the way around, and if you put that onto a pot, the roots will actually take root from those points where I've nicked them. Quite fascinating. Just nestle it in to the soil like so, and perhaps put a little bit of soil or peat moss on the top just to weigh it down a little bit, and that will take quite a few weeks to root, but it is very amazing. Not all plants will grow from a leaf cutting, you realise. These two, the African violet and the piggyback plant, do just perfectly. As does this one. It's a succulent plant. And I've thrown that onto a piece of wet washing paper. It's grown its roots and it's formed a new little plant down the bottom. It's that easy. Now, this is another way to go. These are horse tablets. Well, they're not really. They're actually peat pots. If you throw that into a glass of water, it will swell up in a few moments and you can plant the cutting straight into that peat pot and it will grow its roots, it will retain moisture and then you can plant it directly into your pot. And there's a third way of propagating house plants and that's by division. You can do this with many of the ferns, like the fishbone fern or this snake plant. And you can see that at the base of this one, there's little clumps that are ready to divide. Tap it out of its pot and then bang it around and really loosen up the soil. And you'll find that you'll be able to ease those roots apart with a separate new clump that can be specially potted into its own pot. You might have to use a sharp kitchen knife to get through those roots, but that will divide it very simply. So experiment with all of these ways of propagating and have fun. In a garden, it's the flowering plants that people really take notice of. The same with your indoors. There's so many house plants that are beautiful and brightly coloured that you'd be amazed. The African violet has been popular for years and these days it's been bred for a compact form as well as to keep flowering for a very long time over the year. 
They need to be put in a brightly lit situation, but not right up against a windowsill where the sun might burn the leaves. They need to be moist, but not overly wet. And when it comes time to water them, use tepid water, not cold water straight out of the tap. Water under the leaves so the foliage doesn't get damaged. And if you do have damaged foliage or perhaps spent flowers, always prick them off and throw them away because disease can spread. I can nearly bet you if your African violets aren't flowering properly as you'd like, you need to repot them. Remove some of the outer leaves, repot them into good African violet mix and give them a feed with some African violet food. Now you've got these ones here that are a good sized flowering plant, but have a look at those dear little miniature African violets, they're rather cute. And what a spectacular flower the bromeliad is. They come in all sorts of colours and they flower for a very long time. When you're watering the bromeliads, make sure that you mist the leaves as well and only water down in the centre of the rosette, not down in the compost. The good thing about them, it'll stay in a pot like this for a long time because they don't have to repot it. They really do need to be repotted. And look at these. These are calancholis. They come in all sorts of bright, vibrant colours. And I can imagine them all potted together in one terracotta pot. They look great. They love a sunny position. And when their flowers do finish, nip the old spent flowers off and throw them away. Give them a liquid feed and they'll come back into bloom as happy as Larry. Now, being a member of the succulent family, you can actually see that they are very moist in their leaves. You do not need to water these very much at all. In fact, let them dry out completely between waterings and they'll reward you. These ones are great. New Guinea impatience. I like the look of them because of the butterfly-shaped petals. And they're marvellous things. They love a sunny, warm position on a patio or indoors and keep them moist. That's vital. If they lose their moisture, the flowers will drop off and then you're left with a dead, ugly plant. Make sure that when they're in flower, Liquid feed them every couple of weeks and they'll really reward you. And the contrasting leaves make them rather attractive too. Every now and again, prune them back just a little bit so that they keep that compact habit of growth. And how's this for a table decoration? The red brats of a poinsettia make me always think of Christmas. And its close relative, the euphorbia, is another beauty with red brats and the real flowers are tiny little ones inside in the middle. They're great. They need a maximum amount of sun and between waterings, let them dry out and they'll give endless fun for you. And what about this for a display? Begonias have wonderful coloured leaves as well as the beautiful flowers. They do need a bright, sunny, warm position, so it might be best grown in the warmer parts of Australia. Every now and again, turn them and rotate them in their pots so that each leaf is getting equal amount of sun. When you're watering them, don't overwater them. Let them dry out between waterings, and that's quite important. It's also important to repot them and feed them in spring so they do keep flowering. And for some instant colour, why not bring a plant from outside inside, like this area? It's a compact one. If you buy it in bud, you'll get up to four to six weeks of flower, and then you throw it away, but it does provide lots of colour. These ladies' purses are rather unusual. They're a calcellaria, and they're called that because they do look like an old-fashioned purse. They like a good, indirect light position. Drench the soil when it becomes dry, but don't get the water on the flowers or the foliage. And then you remove the blooms for the best results. They're terrific things, but once again, they only flower for four to six weeks. But if you do want something that's really long flowering, try a cyclamen because they flower from April right through to October. People often put them too near a heater. Don't do that. They hate the heat. In fact, at night, put them outside where they get that fresh air and ventilation around them. When you're watering, just like the African violets, don't water the top of the leaves. Just turn the leaves up and water them underneath so that's the only part that gets moist. Feed them with some liquid fertiliser once every three weeks when they're in bloom. And then when they're finished, once the hot weather comes, that's their dormant time. Everything will die down, so lie the pot on its side outdoors, and then in January or February, repot them. Orchids always attract interest. This one is the Phalaenopsis orchid, the slipper orchid, and it needs really good drainage. And have a look at the pansy orchid. That's a pretty little thing. Life requirements may vary, so always have a good look at the tag. 
as it is with all house plants. And with all of these flowering plants available, there's bound to be one to suit your taste. Many house plants are grown simply for their foliage. They're very often very hardy, which makes them ideal for an office space or for people who are very busy and don't have much time to spend maintaining their house plants. The Aspidistra is a perfect example. It's called the cast iron plant commonly, and it really does live up to that name. It was very common in grandma's time, and now it's becoming even more popular because it is so easy to look after. Don't overwater it. In fact, it hates being overwatered. It'll go mushy if you do. It likes to be pot bound, in fact. You don't have to repot it at all because the more the roots are congested, the happier it'll be. It really is thriving on neglect. The asparagus fern is another one. This is asparagus plumosa. It's not a member of the fern family, but it does have very graceful tiny leaves. And they often give us a telltale sign if you haven't watered it because they go brown or yellow on the tips and then the tiny little leaves fall off onto the carpet. You must keep it moist, keep the humidity around the leaves and certainly moisture in the pot. That's a beauty because it is really very hardy. Pilia numellera folia, well, what a terrible name, but it has got a common name called Creeping Charlie, much easier to remember. It's got a lime green leaf, which is very attractive, and these long trailing stems that hang down. When you notice any yellow leaves, make sure you give it a feed with some liquid fertiliser. And if you have a friend who's got one of those, they're easy to take a cutting from. Asparagus springer eye is another very hardy one. And it will tell you also when it needs a drink because the tiny leaves will fall to the ground. But it looks good in a basket, it's very hardy, and it will take a dappled, filtered sunlight. The philodendrons are many and varied. They come in bushy shapes or ones that climb up stakes and the roots actually attach themselves into the stake. Feed that occasionally in spring with some slow release fertiliser and the glossy green leaves should be kept clean. You'll find that that's a marvellous plant because it stands a darkish position indoors. For something a little taller, the Asian bell tree is a beauty. Radamachia is its name and it's a very graceful tree. It'll grow to about a metre high and in a favourable position might even get up to 2.5 metres. And once it does that, take it outside and put it on the patio or in a protective position out in the garden. It does like a lot of water over summer and if you don't water it, it'll lose those lovely graceful fronds. So keep the water up to it and keep it fertilised as well. If you're looking for something a little different, why not try a variegated plant? A different backy is a good one because it's got beautiful cream markings with a green edge. It is a little difficult to grow because it won't stand being overwatered and it doesn't like drafts, especially in winter, so keep them out of a cold position inside. But for something simpler, why not the snake plant? It's got sword shaped leaves with a lovely variegated outside edge and it's a beauty to grow. And there's also the ones that are spotted in colour. The spectacular feature of the Marantas are these blotches on their leaves. The markings are terrific, but be careful of too much bright sun because that can fade the colours. Keep the potting mix moist and make sure you mist the leaves regularly. At night, the leaves fold up like hands clasped in prayer and that gives the common name of the prayer plant. But if it's real colour you want, have a look at these. The crotons come in a variety of vivid foliage. They're wonderful. They do need good light, that's essential, and water liberally in spring and summer, but then cut back a little bit in winter. The coleus is also called the rainbow plant, and you can see why with the variety of beautiful coloured leaves. They look like they've been hand painted. They need as much light as possible, and they like moisture at all times. And keep pinching them back so they don't go to flower, but keep producing wonderful leaves. It looks like it's been spray painted, but it hasn't been. It's the freckle face plant, and it's grown solely for the nature of its colourful leaves. To keep it bushy and compact, keep nipping out the top, and keep it evenly moist and in a bright sunny position. It's the elegance of palms that make them always popular. They really are an architectural feature in a house. 
The beauty of palms is that generally they'll take a bright position, but this one is a Kentia palm and will also take a very dark position if you've got that. All palms hate to be overwatered, so let them dry out completely between waterings. And don't be tempted to overpot them. They would much prefer to stay in their pot with as little root disturbance as possible. Another architectural plant is the umbrella plant with glossy green leaves in the shape of your finger. And if you miss those leaves, they'll come up bold as brass. They're terrific. Don't overwater the plant in winter, but in summer, do give it plenty of moisture. And give it a feed also in spring, because they really appreciate that. It'll grow quite tall, even up to three metres high. By that stage, it might be looking a little tatty down below because the leaves will start to drop off. So take it outside into a protected position. The fig has always been a popular one. This is Ficus elastica decora with glossy, thick green leaves and it does quite well in a dark position. It doesn't need much moisture. In fact, it thrives on neglect, this one. If you do ever take it outside, be very careful of its roots because they can damage drains quite easily. It's a very strong, robust plant. So be wary of that one if you plant it in your garden. And then Monsteria, the Monstera deliciosa. It's a beauty because it's got thick, glossy green leaves again that get into these wonderful finger-like shapes. And you need to wipe that over to get the dust off it. It's a very easy plant to grow, loves the moisture, loves the heat. And that one will suit any sort of position in your house. In actual fact, there is no such thing as an indoor plant, but of all the house plants, the foliage ones are the most adaptable. If you're wanting something away from the tried and true of a houseplant, try cacti. They have intriguing shapes, the patterns of their spikes, the colours of the grafts, and have a look at the beautiful flowers. You can group them in a cluster in one pot, like a cacti family, or you can have a single specimen. Children just love these with the wobble eyes. For these desert cacti, choose the sunniest spot in the house, especially in winter and then in summer give them a little bit of fresh air. For watering, keep them dry in winter, and that's very important, or else root rot can set in. In summer, you increase the watering as the mix dries out, about once every week, give them a good water. These cacti would look terrific in an office space, or if you have a modern style of home. They're virtually maintenance free, and I can bet you that they'll live longer than you or I. From the crazy to the classic, it's the beautiful Cymbidium orchids that make ideal indoor plants. They'll flower for up to 10 weeks if you bring them inside and put them in a well-lit situation and water them thoroughly once a week. The Cymbidium orchids always remind me of butterflies. It's their colour and their shape that are so intriguing. This is the mix that you use when you're repotting your orchids. You can see how large and clumpy the bits are of bark and that ensures good drainage because orchid roots hate to sit in water. By watering through that, the water just runs straight away. You can tell when your orchids need repotting, they start to bulge out of the pots. And every couple of years you should do that. Take them out of their pots. When they're finished flowering, and that's round about Melbourne Cup Day, repot them and then put them under the lemon tree or under some shady protection for summer. On the other hand, these are plants that have no root problems at all because they have no roots. They're Tillandsias, the true air ferns, and you can mount them on a little piece of bark or cork or even a piece of wood. And as long as you dump them in the sink to give them a water once a week, they will be happy as Larry. Wouldn't this look terrific as interior decorating in a modern office? Well, you can create the same effect in your own house by using things like the air fern. It's the old man's beard and it's terrific because you could hang it in the bathroom where it loves the humidity. Bromeliads are a wonderful plant also. You can make your own bromeliad tree by collecting an old branch or a piece of driftwood. You attach the bromeliad with sphagnum moss around its roots and then attached by wire or twist ties around the branch. Bromeliads are terrific. They're actually a rosette of leaves with the flowers coming from the centre and you must keep that moist in the centre. They'll flower for a very long time in a cheerful sunny spot. These ones have been flowering for ages and it tells me that that rosette there is going to die in the next few years. So the little offset to its side needs to be repotted and that will give you pleasure for many, many years. And who could guess how old this one is? Certainly a beautifully shaped mature bonsai is a lovely thing. And many people think they make an ideal houseplant. 
well here's a warning, they don't. They can really only have a spell indoors for four or five days at a time. Leave them in a well-lit spot and mist the leaves daily. Then take it out onto the patio where it can be admired by many. For people who really want something very curious, why not try the insect eating plants? They're plants that actually devour flesh of little tiny insects. You've got the sundews, for instance. They've got sticky hairs on their leaves that trap the insects and then they curl over. They're quite fascinating. The pitcher plants, of course, are very attractive. Their leaves are actually modified leaves looking like a pitcher that contains juice at the bottom and the insects fall down. They're very attractive plants in their own right. Then, of course, you've got the Venus flytrap and it's an amazing trapping mechanism because it actually snaps shut over the insect prey. If you have them on the windowsill, that's fine, as long as you sit them in a saucer of water over the summer so they never dry out. In winter, you might think that they've died back, but no, they've gone into dormancy. And if you repot them in early spring into some coarse river sand and peat moss, they'll come good and you'll end up with a marvellous insect eating plant. Isn't nature an amazing thing? When you see all these strange and curious plants, they really make great talking points. There are many unusual and different ways of creating a terrarium. This one used to be a fish tank and now it's a terrarium that's used as a room divider between the lounge and the dining room. It's filled with masses of indoor plants that grow very well because of the grow light. And here's a tabletop terrarium. It looks really terrific when you're looking down on these plants. The first ingredient you need to make a terrarium is scoria rock. When you buy this from a nursery, scoria rock is volcanic lava rock, which is really good because it's fine to put down at the bottom of the base of this container because it hasn't got any drainage. And so you need the scoria for drainage, just leave it out like so. Next comes the charcoal. This is horticultural charcoal. You need just a little bit at the bottom, a couple of handfuls at the bottom of the terrarium because that keeps the soil that I'm going to put on next, that keeps it sweet. Potting mix is important, uh, a, good, a good quality potting mix. And you just put it down the bottom like so. And you might make, like to make it into hills and vales and dales just so that the whole scene looks a little bit interesting and different. Next comes the plants. And here we've got the iris seam. What you need to do is take it out of the pot and then just tickle the roots and put it in the back there. This is going to be quite a tall plant, so you need to make sure that it goes nicely in the back and that'll just reflect very, very well with the other plants that I'm going to put in there with very coloured foliage. Now, the next one is a variation on the theme. This is a different back here. This one doesn't need tickling all that much, but that'll be quite a strong growing plant. Once again, in the back of the terrarium, make a hole, put the roots in like so, and then cover the roots up. Here's a different leaf one altogether. This is called a pilia, and it's a nice one because it's got a silvery leaf. The more variation that you get into the terrarium, the better. Now, this is going to grow just in the front there. Tickle the roots out, make a hole for it, and then Press it in like so, and as long as the soil is covering the roots, you're pretty right. The neat little one is the peperomia. That's one of my favourites. There are many different kinds of peperomias with sort of little rills and uh, veins along the leaves, which look at, make it look rather good. This one only grows as a compact little shrub, as an indoor plant. It's a very hardy little creature, and that one's going to fit in very nicely just into here like so. The next thing to go in is a bit of driftwood. Find it along the beach and it looks really sort of a rustic thing to add into a terrarium. And the old plants like the prayer plants are sometimes they're called, that'll just fit in nicely in there in the back there. It's a spot little plant, it's got nice chocolate dots for the leaf and it looks terrific. One of the lower ground covering plant is the Petonia. It's a beauty because it fits in very well and it's a low growing thing that will just snuggle its way along the surface of the soil and that'll just fit in just nicely into that little corner there. Really pack out a terrarium because you can always cut them back, you can always um, get to them with the scissors or the secateurs and just chop them back if they're looking too large. 
Now, this one's a Selaginella moss. It's the gold form of Selaginella, and that will grow quite, <laughs> as a ground cover, will grow quite large and really take over. So you do need to get at that and keep it under control. But that will actually cover the soil quite nicely. If you wanted to, you could put gravel and things like that around there also, but it really doesn't need it. As with any plant, you need to water these ones in. And this is the very final time you'll do this because terrariums are really their own source of water. The plants breathe out the water through the leaves through transpiration. It collects as condensation on the sides of the glass windows and then dribbles down back into the soil and the plants use it again. It's like a merry-go-round of the watering system. That's all you need to do. Put the lid back on, which can be removed to take out a dead plant or maybe remove a dying leaf and you'll be really happy with them and they're easy and fun to do. It's great to get away for holidays, but you can't take your house plants with you. Now, it's nothing more frustrating than when you come home after several weeks and find them dead or bedraggled looking. If you can't find a friend or a neighbour to help you water them, well, what you need to do is take some preventative steps. And one of the simplest is to take them off the windowsill where they're getting hot, direct sunlight and put them in a group away, more indirect sunlight. Give them a good drink and that'll do them for several days. For longer periods of time, this is an interesting principle. This is a little euphorbia, sitting in a pot with a wick of cotton coming from the drainage hole that little cotton wick sits into this other container. It's quite decorative and that's got water in it and by capillary reaction, the wick takes up the water into the plant's roots. It's quite a neat idea and you can make the same sort of idea in your own home. A calanchoe, it doesn't need a lot of water, but it's sitting, there's the wick again, a little cotton wick that sits into the water in a plastic container like that with its lid with a hole cut into the middle of it so that the pot just nestles in like that and that's perfect. For larger pots, you can use the same principle in an ice cream container. A similar method is this one here, where you use a piece of nylon stocking, and I've pushed the nylon stocking through the drainage hole at the bottom with a knitting needle, and then out the other side, and that can just sit in the sink and soak up water as the plant needs it. Now that's fine for a single plant, but if you've got a grouping of plants, Put them onto a towel and using the same principle, use the end of the towel as a wick, put it into the sink so it soaks up the water and gives the plants humidity around their leaves. To retain the humidity, group your plants in a little family grouping like that. By doing that, the humidity is kept up around their leaves and they'll be much happier for it. To increase the humidity level around the leaves, give them a fine mist spray all over the foliage. Gravel and palm peat are good. If you sit them in a container, the palm peat retains water very well. And if you nestle a plant on top of that, it's going to get humidity around the leaves, but the roots are not going to rot by sitting in water. Now, the same principle applies with a maidenhair fern. The gravel at the bottom of the saucer or a container, put some water into that so that there's high humidity around the leaves. The roots don't rot by actually sitting in water, but that maidenhair fern really enjoys growing like that. Using a baking dish is a good idea for a group of plants. Put some old crock from broken pots at the bottom, fill it up with water, and then place the plants on the top, and they'll do just fine. Another way of retaining moisture around the plant's roots is to use water-saving granules. Some of the potting mixes do have them in, especially for house plants, and what they do is they swell up and retain the water around the plant's roots. If you haven't got any in around your plants at the moment, make a hole with a pencil or a biro, and just pour a small amount in. One gram to one litre of potting mix is fine. And then they will swell up to make a jelly-like substance like that, which allows the water to go out to the plant's roots as it's needed. A bath is a good place to store your plants when you go on holidays, especially if you've got a big collection of them or some larger specimens because they fit into a bath quite well. Put the plug into the outlet and then line the bath with newspaper. And you've always got plenty of newspaper lying around your house. And I've pre-wet this, but you can wet it as you go. Then the plants will sit on top of that newspaper and they'll remain moist just by grouping them together like that. You can use sphagnum moss to line them around the tops of the pots, or if you haven't got any of that, just use some newspaper pre-wetted. And they will last for weeks. 
If you do get home from holidays to find your plants looking a bit bedraggled, give them a good drink of water by dunking them in a bucket. welcoming sight and that's what house plants do they really cheer up a house you can have them on a piece of furniture or on the windowsill or even on the floor they look great this one is a primula obconica that's left in its original container and just sunk into a copper pot so it really enhances the beauty of it if you're dealing with primula obconicas many people are allergic to the leaves and they have to wear gloves fortunately i don't have to now this is a very long, dark hallway, no natural lighting in it at all. And many people will say, oh, I've got a dark position inside, can I grow anything in there? You can, there are various types of plants that do quite well in a dark position, and this is one of them. This is Dracaena derimensis. It has strap-like leaves that are very thick and leathery, and that's the secret of success. Indoor plants in a dark position really do have to have those leathery leaves. It's a good architectural plant. The monster. The Monstera deliciosa is a good one. It also has thick leathery leaves, quite architectural shaped, those leaves. And my old favourite, the cast iron plant, or the Aspidistra. It thrives on neglect and don't overwater them. They do terrifically well in a dark position. It's a great idea to use sphagnum moss around the top of the pots because it looks much more attractive than just looking at soil. But it also helps water retention. Now, when it comes to pots, Make them matching if they're on a very decorative sort of piece of furniture. If you're bringing the pots from outside, just be careful that you don't have gravel or little bits of soil around there because it can damage the furniture. And if the pots are likely to leak, make sure that you put a doily or something underneath just so you protect the furniture. And of course, make sure that you clean the outside of the pots regularly. Another room where people like to grow houseplants is in the bathroom. There's a little bit more natural lighting and it's the high humidity that really encourages great success with many plants. Things like the maidenhair fern, for instance, grow well in a bathroom because they do appreciate that high humidity around their leaves. Also keep them moist around the pot as well. The spathophyllum, also known as the Madonna lily, is a beauty too because with the glossy green leaves and these lovely white flowers that contrast against the leaves, it looks attractive, but it also appreciates the high humidity and the warmth of a bathroom. And have a look at those lovely African violets. Clustered together in a wicker basket, they look terrific and they'll flower on and on for a very long time. And of course, if you've got talcum powder being scattered around, you'll need occasionally to wipe the leaves of your house plants because the leaves can easily get clogged up. A sunnier position in the house is usually the living area and there's plenty of scope for house plants there. The thing that takes my eye here is the simplicity of this decoration. The gerbers are left in their own little pots and put into a rather rustic looking container which is actually made of lavender so when you get close to it you can smell it. It is rather pretty. And in a room this size you can have plenty of house plants and it really brings the garden inside. And if you've got a stark or rather plain wall, why not decorate it with something green, like the fishbone fern always looks terrific. It's hardy, just needs moisture, and it gives a bit of life to a wall like that. And what about this plant grouping? It not only looks attractive, but it creates its own little microclimate so that the air humidity is kept high around the leaves. This is a dizzy gothica, it's got an unusual shape leaf and it contrasts nicely with the broader, thicker leaves of the umbrella plant. And have a look at that colour of the anthurium, the flamingo flower. Contrasts well with the lime green of the aurelia plant. That's a beauty. And then the delicacy of a maidenhair fern just tops it all off. When you're planting as a group, the best idea is to match up the pots because it's much more effective. These ones are terracotta with a lime wash and it gives them that antique sort of look. If you don't want to plant directly into the pots, use a piece of plastic at the bottom to protect your carpet and just hide that well. The use of mirrors really extends the beauty of these primulas. I've brought them from outside and put them inside for a couple of days and then outside again to freshen them up. And to improve them, a little bit of bush moss around the pots just to hide them and that really does make them look just extra special. And here's a terracotta pot with some small growing plants in it, all left in their own little pots, and this time covered with gravel. And what about 
palms to fill a large space in a room. This one's the Cantia palm, very elegant. They're expensive, but you can get smaller ones and they'll grow pretty quickly. This one here is the Shamadoria elegance, or the Palo palm. You can grow them singly or together for a really striking effect. Use potted plants as a table decoration. These are cycling them, they look really cheery, but use your imagination. And for a traditional table decoration, put out poinsettias and a Christmas tree. I'm sure you enjoy the video. House plants really are wonderful. Be sure to keep it safe and handy so that you can refer back to the video whenever you wish. I'll see you again on Gardening Australia. In the meantime, happy gardening. The world of organic gardening is made easy with Gardening Australia's practical organic gardening video. Join Peter Cundall as he takes you from soil testing and soil enrichment to the biggest and tastiest vegetables you'll ever grow. Avoid the use of poisons and volatile chemicals in all parts of your garden by calling 008 800 933 for your copy of this informative video. Go organic. Call 008 800 933. And there you have it, everyone. That was the full video of Jaded Manson's Guide to Houseplants from 1992. And I hope you had fun watching this video as much as I have. So, do you like all my content? Please make sure to comment, subscribe, and smash that like button. And after you've done it, you'll be notified when a new video is on my channel. So, I'll see you guys in the next one.